experience in research on inclusive innovation, social entrepreneurship, venture philanthropy, and technology digitalization. She will be talking about how India's social innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystem has responded to COVID-19. Before we begin, we have some house rules. All the participants expect this, except the speaker and the moderator is requested to remain muted and switch off their webcams. But we encourage your participation through the exit in chat box. Some selected questions will be answered by the speaker. Now, without further ado, I welcome Dr. Nina Soni to commence the lecture. Thank you very much. Um, I hope I am clearly audible to everyone. And uh, can I ask uh, everyone to turn their cameras off so that we don't lose too much bandwidth? Thank you. Um, all right, so let me also share my presentation. Okay, I hope uh, this is clear for everyone to see. So uh, I'm looking forward to talking to you about uh, the social enterprise and innovation ecosystem in India and um, how it's been responding to the COVID-19 challenge. Uh, sorry. So let me start by just sort of explaining what the social enterprise ecosystem is. Uh, and enterprise, uh, the social enterprise and innovation ecosystem is. So um, when we talk about social innovation, the broad definition is, of course, just like innovation is something new uh, in the local context, a social innovation is a, is a new solution to a social problem, a social issue um, that is more efficient than previous um, uh, solutions, that is more sustainable, uh, and of course is uh, just and uh, a social uh, solution rather than say a um, money, uh, sorry, a, a solution that is primarily based on uh, increased revenue or lower cost and such like. So um, a social innovation can be an outcome uh, or it can be a process. So it's both a process and an outcome. Um, we're talking, what I'm going to be talking about today is both innovation and entrepreneurship because it's all sort of mixed up in the social impact sector that I'm talking about. So social enterprises then are sometimes innovators, sometimes not. Uh, but they are agents of social change. They are just great entrepreneurs that take an idea and they try to take it to market. Now market, of course, in this space sometimes means uh, bringing it to uh, beneficiaries, bringing it to low-income customers, bringing it uh, to a, a, a social problem, to solve a social problem. Um, and the key thing here when we talk about social entrepreneurship and social impact sector and the social impact space is that we talk about a dual bottom line. So in this space, people create social value as well as financial return. Uh, and again, so of course, when we talk about what these entrepreneurs and innovators are creating, it might be a product, it might be a service, um, or it might be um, providing uh, livelihood opportunities for the poor. So you have some examples here. You have uh, uh, Help Us Green, which is a social enterprise that creates livelihoods for the poor by uh, creating angambatis out of um, flowers that have been used and discarded in temples. You have um, Aravind Eye Hospital, which provides low-cost uh, eye care for poor people by cross-subsidizing. So they have paying customers and then they're able to cross-subsidize to poor customers. Uh, and then of course, uh, there's Grand Orgia in the energy space that create um, uh, local energy systems, uh, disconnected if you're um, in rural areas. Um, and so some of the, sorry. I'm jumping ahead of myself here. So some of the key characteristics then of, of, of this of social enterprises and innovators is um, in India especially is a, is a real focus on poverty alleviation, poverty alleviation and development. Uh, that varies a bit in different countries, but in India, social enterprises are focused on poverty alleviation. Um, at the same time, we have no definition of social enterprises in India. So different dif individuals have different ideas of what social enterprises are. 
Um, and so they vary a great deal. They, we have a very wide range of social enterprises in India. They can come across the spectrum from very social civil society organizations on the one hand and all the way to the other, which is more like a regular startup or regular corporate organization. Um, we also have uh, organizations that exist across all sectors, especially what we usually call critical needs sectors, so agriculture, education, livelihoods, renewable energy, transport, and such like. Um, and then, of course, uh, the, the main challenge with the social enterprises, of course, is that they are often operating in environments and geographies and locations where it can be very difficult to use existing supply chains um, or there are no existing supply chains. So you often have to create um, your own distribution systems, your own supply chains, um, skill people up to create maintenance systems, etc. Um, so this is usually what we refer to as last mile connectivity issues. And the last point I want to make here before we get into more of the COVID response to give you some context is that the social enterprise ecosystem is thriving in India. So India is, is one of the best known um, countries in the world in terms of just having a lot of activity in this social enterprise innovation space. Um, that goes for social enterprises uh, and innovators, but that also goes for all the support, eco the support organizations that are there to uh, help these entrepreneurs and innovators succeed and scale up. Um, so you have a range of stakeholders. You have uh, investors and angel networks, just like you have in the regular startup ecosystem here, they're called, they're called impact investors and angel, uh, impact investors. We also have um, social incubators and accelerators, um, a whole bunch of different technical service providers, whether it's legal services, accounting services, or um, various kinds of consultants. There's a lot of conferences and knowledge prep platforms, knowledge sharing in this space. Um, of course, there's a lot of universities that have um, social enterprise labs, including um, Jindal Global University, of course. Um, there are a bunch of competitions and awards so that early stage enterpri enterprises can uh, win funding very early, very early on with the business model uh, before they might be able to seek a larger chunks of funding from, uh, from investors. Um, there's also a bunch of other things, um, sort of social enterprise journeys where you can go around and, and be inspired and look at different kinds of enterprises. The government has a host of initiatives and there's a number of large foundations, both international and national, that are funding the rest of the ecosystem. So yeah, so the, the main point here is that there's a lot happening generally in the social enterprise ecosystem. And what I wanted to do in today's talk was to, to give you a sense of what is happening during um, this COVID time. All right. So to set the context in terms of COVID, um, we've had, so in India, we've had about nine, uh, six, almost 60,000 uh, official cases to date. I think I got the figures from earlier today. Uh, the hotspots are very much the main metro so far, especially uh, Mumbai has had a lot of uh, cases. Um, since 24th of May, we've had a national lockdown. Uh, it started a little earlier here in Mumbai, where I'm based. Um, and we now, of course, have uh, green, orange, and red zones, as well as containment zones. So depending on what zone you're in, um, you have different levels of ability to move around. Um, there's been a massive strain on the healthcare system, of course, um, and the healthcare system that was already strained prior to COVID. We've also had uh, a migrant crisis, a substantial migrant crisis, and we're also noticing a substantial income and livelihoods crisis across all income sectors, but uh, particularly worrying in the low income segment. Um, and so there is this huge need for collaboration with all, stake, uh, with all stakeholders, um, private, public, academic, what have you, um, in terms of more infrastructure and technology for the healthcare system, um, delivering essential goods and services, providing immediate relief in terms of shelter and food, and offering income and livelihood support, and creating new opportunities for, in, for livelihoods, given what's happened with the, 
the current livelihood um, opportunities. So I think the point to make here before I start about how the social enterprise ecosystem has responded is that two things. So one is that the government has of course responded in a, in a huge way on, on both at the central level, the all India level, as well as the state level. Um, and of course, locally, whether it's uh, district level, panchayat level, et cetera. Um, the other is that civil society has really stepped in. Uh, so that's your NGOs, nonprofits, um, stepped in a, bit, in a big way to provide immediate relief, whether it's providing food for stranded migrants or day laborers, working with migrants who are on their way home, et cetera. Um, so there's also been a lot of CSR funding going into this space uh, in terms of COVID response. And of course, a lot of private companies have stepped up to, uh, to uh, alleviate the effort. So for example, Bipro has opened up, a, have repurposed a, an office space into a hospital in, uh, in Pune, for example. Um, but, but the social impact space, even though it's not at the size of the nonprofit space or the government effort, there's still a lot of interesting initiatives happening here. And, and we think that some of the things that are happening in this space is probably going to have an impact for how the social enterprise and innovation ecosystem moves forward after the, once we're the other side of the crisis. And so what we see now in terms of um, how the social enterprise ecosystem has responded uh, is uh, funders and incubators, are of course, not taking, um, bringing on more enterprises. So there are fewer investments, there are fewer incubators being brought into incubation. Um, there are, uh, there's focus on working with those organizations and companies you already have on board in your portfolio rather than, say, uh, bringing on more. Um, and the other focus has been on a temporary rapid response to the COVID pandemic. Um, for social enterprises and startups on the other side, on the other hand, is very much mirroring this. It's survival mode. Some are in complete survival mode, trying to figure out how to get through the crisis. Others have engaged very quickly in direct relief efforts. So a lot of them work, of course, with poor um, beneficiaries or, or consumers or customers and on a regular basis. And so they've sort of switched their models to work with them during the pandemic. Um, we've also seen some pivoting in uh, social enterprises using their existing models, operational models, and then change them to use um, to work in the relief effort. And there's been some interesting innovation happening in terms of uh, tech, uh, health tech, and um, other things for, um, you know, whether it's ed tech or health tech. So I'll be going through, I've got a few slides now, we'll talk about what different types of actors are doing as a response to the um, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so first, so impact investors. So these are your impacts, your regular investors uh, that are called impact investing investors in the social enterprise ecosystem. Um, like I said, few investments, very much focused on working with existing portfolio companies, um, seeing how they can conserve cash uh, how they can protect the employee's well-being. And what's really important is, of course, making sure that they're mitigating any impact on the beneficiaries due to, say, a lack of funding um, or available cash flow in these, uh, organ in these startups or social startups. Um, a lot of social startups have only about six months cash flow, um, some up to a year, maybe a little longer, but a lot of them are going to run out of cash very soon. So another thing that um, impact investors are looking are doing now is finding ways to pool resources together as a sort of relief, sort of portfolio company relief effort and trying to prioritize how they might, you know, what, what, or what social enterprises one prioritizes during a crisis to try to make sure that at least some of them survive. But there's, there's, a, there's talk of a, a, a large percentage of currently funded social enterprises not surviving the crisis. The second thing um, social enterprises are doing is uh, creating immediate uh, response initiatives. So we have a couple of examples here. Um, Omidia Network, 
uh, which is uh, an international fund, which also has a fund in India, has created a rapid response fund in India for about um, 11 core rupees. Um, so far, they've funded 15 initiatives. And this, these are, so impact investors generally invest with equity and take a stake. But these uh, rapid response initiatives are primarily grant-based. So they've uh, provided grant funding for 15 initiatives to date. Uh, Abishkar, which is another impact investor, has uh, started a, a, an employee, employee grant fund. So both these funds are primarily funded by employees. Um, and they've also started making grant uh, investments or grant donations uh, to uh, organizations that have been applying online seeking funding. And again, very much focused on entities that are providing immediate relief and are doing it on a non-profit basis. So not expecting a profit out of the relief work. Uh, there's also talk in the impact investing space about creating some sort of sector level uh, pool of funding for um, the medium term, medium to long term, to figure out what are we going to do uh, with, say, migrant workers or gig economy workers and others that are day laborers and others that are vulnerable and may not get their employment back. Are there ways to create new interesting financing methods? So um, there's a lot of talk about blended, blended finance approaches now, which is moving away from only looking at equity to looking at a range of different financing, whether it's grant, debt, um, equity and, and other, other bond uh, development impact bonds. So there's, there's also been talks about other new uh, innovative financing models that can be used for, um, for the medium term to help uh, those that can't immediately find work. Okay, um, moving on to incubators and uh, accelerators. Um, so usually, of course, accelerators and incubators, they're essentially providing all the support to startups or social enterprises that investors can't do themselves. So they're hand-holding, they're testing out business models, they're helping out testing out markets and such like. Um, and the social incubators and accelerators work exactly the same. Um, and so in the current scenario, what's happened is that they've stopped the immediate uh, regular incubation acceleration supports so for testing out markets and such like and, and piloting models and instead again just like um, funders impact funders really focusing on ensuring that the current companies in their portfolio can survive um, during the crisis and can then um, you know essentially survive and and, um, and then they'll scale up their efforts once the pandemic has subsided uh, but there's a few other things they're doing so for example uh, Makers Asylum, which isn't strictly an accelerator, it's a, it's a makerspace uh, here in Mumbai as well. They very quickly, within days of uh, the pandemic getting very serious, they started making shields, which is what you see in this image uh, on the top right corner. So they started making M19 shields for hospital staff all over India. And they've now done, made more than 5 lakhs, so 500,000 shields so far. And I think they're aiming for about a million, 10 lakh. Um, Unlimited India and Bilbo are two social incubators in this space, and they have been very busy working with their, a lot of their portfolio companies that are pivoting and uh, providing uh, relief, either direct relief efforts or are innovating to work with, say, farmers and, and others to find ways to uh, improve uh, the supply chains that have been broken. Uh, and then the last example I wanted to give here is not an example from the social and the this conventional social enterprise space. This is uh, the Center for Cellular and Molecular, Molecular Platforms in Bangalore, which is it's an innovation platform uh, in the biotech space in the regular startup ecosystem. But they've been they very quickly deployed um, an, a, an, a, an innovation, a COVID innovation accelerator. And so they've been taking on a lot of new um, innovators and startups that want to test out healthcare and health tech uh, models. Fairly advanced health, healthcare and health, health healthcare and health tech models that they can then deploy in um, in the fight against COVID. And have been quite successful. They're also tied up with a bunch of funders, uh, and they're able to 
of uh, sort of connect these. So they're able to uh, accelerate and speed up these uh, uh, innovators, uh, innovations and uh, entrepreneurial efforts and also connect them to funders so they can quickly scale up if they work well. All right, so the next couple of slides that I have are going to give you uh, some idea of the social enterprises and what they are doing currently. Uh, I've got about six examples of what different social enterprises are doing here. Um, uh, I, so, let, so just to start off, and they're from all sorts of uh, different areas and uh, different parts of the country. So I'll, I'll start off with Frontier Markets, which is a social enterprise in Rajasthan. Uh, they have, so usually they, they, so they used to sell solar uh, lanterns and other solar-based goods in rural Rajasthan using uh, women. So they have about a network of a couple of thousand women, I think, across rural Rajasthan, who they call Sahelis. And uh, they work with these Sahelis to um, sell household goods across villages. Uh, but they completely rejigged their model within a few days of, of, of the uh, lockdown that we got uh, because they realized they set up a call center and realized when they spoke to all their uh, Sahelis and their field staff that as while the government was very much focusing on supplying the cities with goods and services, the rural areas often lacked goods and basic goods, including food, as much as urban areas. So they deployed the field staff to become uh, bulk deliverers of goods in rural villages. And then they worked with the Sahelis who then became delivery partners across uh, these rural villages. So essentially your sort of rural version of your Amazon delivery, delivery agents. Uh, another example I have is, uh, is a social enterprise called Vahan that has, uh, so usually works with um, matching job seekers uh, with available jobs using AI and um, uh, communication apps like WhatsApp. But they've rejigged their app using their platform and some AI tech, and they uh, teamed up with Airtel, and they're now matching uh, migrants and day laborers with available healthcare relief, uh, healthcare jobs, food, shelters, and other sort of immediate relief requirements. And then uh, a third example is from um, Bharat <clears throat> Rohan, which um, usually is a, a data, sort of a data analytics company. So they collect data on farmers and farming in rural areas and then help uh, provide analytics in the agro-processing to be able to plan ahead and, and know how the, uh, supply, what the supply chain looks like for them. Given that the supply chain is broken, and as we, we know, those of us who live in India, there's, there's been a huge issue with bringing goods from uh, producers to consumers. Uh, and that's the, the case with uh, rural fruit and vegetable collection uh, supply chains as well. So in UP, they've been working with 3,600 farmers to create uh, collection centers across a large number of villages so that they, the farmers are still able to sell their goods, even though the supply chains, the regular supply chains are no longer working. All right, so a, a few other examples. First, we have a, a social enterprise called Hak Darshak, um, which has, over the past few years, set up this huge database of schemes from government and state governments as well as uh, private schemes from uh, private trusts and such like. Uh, these are schemes that uh, low-income individuals can access uh, to gain um, facilities to, to get entitlements that they have the right to, have to apply for. Uh, and then they have some innovative um, AI engines and, and mobile uh, applications to be able to work with, uh, to be able to work with low-income consumers on a large, uh, on a large scale. Uh, and they've now used that to add all the different COVID related schemes that exist across the country. And they're working and the, the ground level workers called the Haktarshaks are now going from home to home and ensuring that people know what they can apply for and that they have the kind of right information and documentation that they require. Uh, a second example, and this is one from Mumbai, is a hyper local delivery 
so a hy hyperlocal de delivery model within cities. So um, in Mumbai, for example, in the containment zones, especially in low income uh, areas, uh, so informal settlements or slums, we've, there's been, it's been really problematic to access food because you're not allowed to leave your house. And regular, uh, regular uh, e-retailers or platforms like Zomato and uh, others may not deliver in, uh, be able to deliver in these, in, are not able to deliver in the containment zones. So um, Hunger Project has created um, a network of 30,000 families so far that they're able to deliver to by um, tying up with both the grocery, local, very local grocery shops as well as the, uh, using Google Pay so that uh, these uh, low-income families can then pay for the groceries online, order them, and then have them delivered locally. And then the last uh, example I have is uh, on the healthcare side. So that's Pad Care, Li uh, Pad Care Labs, which uh, usually works with uh, dealing with and cleaning uh, sanitary waste, uh, which is, of course is, is close to medical waste. So what they've done is pivoted their model to use their existing technologies, um, which is a UV-based decontamination product, and they're using that to disinfect uh, hospital equipment and other things that are used in hospitals. So I think this goes to show that there's such a range of social enterprises uh, that have sort of pivoted their models and are able to provide a range of different services, goods and services, in sectors from you know, agriculture, food provision, healthcare, uh, and even um, transport and logistics. All right, so moving back to sort of the uh, macro level of the ecosystem and, and what's happening in the social enterprise space, the other thing that we've seen, which is quite new uh, in the social enterprise space, is a lot of um, interesting collaborations across multiple stakeholders. So for example, we have the par parliamentarians with innovators in India, which is a long, uh, long name. Um, this, is a cross, this is a group of cross-party MPs, uh, together with policy experts, think tanks, and investors, both impact investors and regular startup investors, that have come together and started a grant um, that they are, uh, um, sorry, started a grant fund, and they are now accepting applications from uh, startups and individuals working either in the healthcare space, healthcare systems again, or in terms of community care and caring for vulnerable people. We've also seen uh, a, a, um, the COVID Action Collaborative, which is not a fund. This is a collaborative of more than 150 organizations from across public, private, civil society, ac academic spaces, uh, and of course, social enterprise space, which is um, sort of getting together to figure out what's happening on the, on the ground, pairing notes in terms of relief efforts, uh, exchanging information, and finding a space to collaborate. And also, of course, ideating new solutions. Um, and then um, next week, there's going to be a conference on the social innovation and social enterprise space and their response to COVID-19 uh, online by the Natch Foundation. Um, so just again, to show that this the social enterprise ecosystem has responded very quickly uh, in, in a very collaborative manner, which is quite different from what we've seen previously. And then of course, the last thing to mention here in terms of collaborative efforts, again, not, a strictly, uh, not, not, strict, uh, not a strictly social innovation slash enterprise uh, initiative, but uh, it's the Action COVID-19 team or ACT, which is, um, conventional startup funders, primarily in the IT space, uh, IT and tech space, that have come together to create a 100 core innovation fund, uh, which is focused on healthcare and health tech. And I think mental health is included there, but strictly within the health, healthcare, health systems ambit. Uh, so far, 36 initiatives have been funded to date uh, from across India. Uh, primarily regular startups, but I include it here because I think it's really interesting to see that whilst before we had a fairly, uh, the social enterprise ecosystem and the, and the regular startup ecosystems were quite divided or quite separate, now we're seeing a, a lot more 
engagement between the two spaces or sectors. Okay, so um, this is my last slide with some sort of key insights on what, what's been happening so far and what might we take with us uh, when all this is over. What's, new, what's happening that is new and, and how might we, you know, might this be something we want to keep uh, long after the pandemic has, uh, has subsided. So the first thing, and what I mentioned earlier on, is, is this uh, idea of blended finance. So the social impact space or social enterprise space has, for the last couple of years or so, talked about the need for blended finance, the need for innovation in finance beyond either grants, debt finance, or equity finance. Uh, or just the fact that you can mix the three up. They've been very separate until very recently. Uh, but I think what we see now, we've seen impact investors who usually deal with equity suddenly setting up grant uh, instruments. And we've seen um, discussions of uh, using development impact bonds um, in new ways going forward to deal with sort of medium to long-term economic and livelihoods impacts of, of the pandemic. So I think we're going to see a lot more focus on, on what is the most useful type of finance rather than just sticking to the, the existing instrument, financial instruments we have and then picking uh, social enterprises and startups that work, that fit with those instruments. The other thing that has been uh, very interesting is to see that there's a much higher visibility of migrants, poor, low-income consumers in general, and the challenges they face, which sounds a little bit crazy given that this is the social impact ecosystem, but a lot of the social impact ecosystem in India is very um, urban-based, and it is pretty English-speaking. And so it's, it's, not a, it's not necessarily a space that is as well connected with the grassroots as, say, the civil society spaces in this country. So I think what we've had a, a much higher visibility uh, of the challenges that poor people, uh, migrants, day laborers uh, face on a day-to-day -day basis, which might hopefully impact the way funds are deployed and social enterprises are selected or the way social enterprises choose to work in future. Uh, we've seen rapid deployment of new funding and also this rapid deployment of accelerators and other initiatives. Again, this is something that is, um, is quite new that some, that this sort of, and it ties in with my next point about mission-based funding. It's very quick uh, mission-focused deployment of funds get coming together um, trying to find ecosystem level solutions that can then support uh, what's happening on the ground and support entrepreneurs to support NGOs and others working on the ground or even individuals. Um, again, like I said, mission based funding, we've had um, primarily say sector based, either sector based or stage based investors so far or funding, um, but hopefully with the COVID um, pandemic and the focus on missions and being quite strategic, this might be something that we carry with us um, longer, in the longer term, uh, so that funding becomes much more e efficiently focused on certain target areas rather than say, having yearly, having different focus sectors every year, so um, for example, which is, has been quite common in the past where you have, uh, you focus on one area one year and then there's another area that becomes almost fashionable another year. Uh, again, tying back into this higher visibility of the poor, um, there's been a much bigger focus on the actual impact of the funding. What is the funding doing and what is the, what is the social enterprise actually doing with that funding and what impact is it having? Uh, and slightly less a focus on, you know, of course, are we going to get a return for this money, especially the grant vehicles that we've seen. So there's a hope here that um, in future that the balance between the social return on investment and the financial return on investment will balance, will, will be skewed towards social return as opposed to financial return. We've also seen a lot more collaboration between the different stakeholders, uh, especially in India. Uh, this, while people have always been collaborating, there's not been, um, it's not been on the scale that we've seen now, which has been really interesting. We've also, and related to this, we've seen more deployment of domestic capital 
uh, whether by domestic funders or individuals and such like. Again, that is not something we, that was very common prior to um, the pandemic. So we've, ha of course, there are domestic funds, but a lot of domestic funds uh, struggle to raise domestic capital. A lot of the capital comes from abroad in the social impact space. And uh, in the last couple of years, there has been a lot of conversations about how to engage more high net worth individuals and ensure that the impact funds are better funded by domestic capital or bringing in more domestic capital into the space more generally. And uh, hopefully this is something that we will see going forward. And my last point here uh, is that, of course, there's been a real focus on this idea of low income tech, useful tech that works for the poor, that works for low income households, that work for people who may not have a, a huge digital um, capability. Uh, and so it's essentially moving away from a focus on digital technologies for, for say the urban, for the urban consumer, which is what a lot of startups have focused on before, to perhaps more of a focus on digital technologies that work for the masses that work for everyone. And I think this also means that we're having a bit of a blurring now of social enterprise slash innovation ecosystem on the one hand and social enterprises. And on the other hand, regular startups and the regular startup ecosystem. Um, also a little bit of blurring of um, investors. So that we're now seeing investors investing in what's essentially social impact entities or social impact ideas. Um, and hopefully this could actually bring a more, uh, almost a more competitive social, social, ecosystem, social enterprise ecosystem, but, you know, bring more um, enterprises, more startups into the social space and perhaps trigger even um, better solutions, better ideas and, and better ways of scaling those existing ideas. And so I think, um, I think that's about it. Let me just see. So the last couple of points I wanted to make is, um, so, is sorry. So I think the, the, the last point I wanted to make as well is that um, what we've seen so far is that the, social, the spaces or the sectors that are social, whether it's say health tech, um, whether it's agriculture, they're not doing too badly, especially in rural areas compared to um, other more conventional startup uh, companies. So I think tying back to this general idea of, are we going to see a blurring of social enterprises and regular enterprises and startups? Um, are we going to see a blurring of not focusing so much on the, uh, the urban companies but also looking at the rural economy as helping to uh, bring the economy back and grow the economy back to what it was. So I think there's a lot of questions here on what will work, how will we, um, you know, what will work, what will stay, but it's a really interesting opportunity for the social enterprise and um, innovation ecosystem to um, test out what works and scale up some of the good ideas and you, things like uh, using blended finance, whether that's working, um, increasing this idea of, of uh, increasing the focus on social impact and increasing the um, collaboration across stakeholders. So I think that's what I had uh, in terms of the webinar and my presentation. Thank you, Dr. Sunil uh, ma'am. That was a very insightful talk. It is very good to know that the social enterprises are equally contributing to elevate the country from the whole scenario. And uh, people have been very interested about the urban dwellers, but uh, somehow we always forget the rural part of India, which is very much large and we have a lot of population there. The women group that you, that you were talking about, the Sahelis, they have been doing a very wonderful work. Like, they have uh, abridged the gap between the supply chain, whatever breakages that have been, they're trying to restore it. And the organization Hagdarsh, like they have committed that, that they have committed themselves for these people, despite this coronavirus situation. With all of these uh, social enterprises doing so much, it makes us think as individuals, how we can be a part of all these things. And that's very great. So with that, 
that uh, we'll be moving on to the question and answer session. The first question is from Mr. Vikram Chatterjee, a software engineer from Lagarsis, Switzerland. And his question is, how do you think social entrepreneurs in India will re-innovate them differently from their European or American counterparts post-COVID? What is your take on it, ma'am? What was the, what, could you repeat the middle of the question? How will they be different? Yes, ma'am. Uh, so, uh, how do you think social ent entrepreneurs in India will re-innovate them differently from their European or American counterparts post-COVID? Okay, thank you. That's a really interesting question. Um, I think, so the big difference I think in general uh, already is that social enterprises and social startups in India are very, uh, are very focused on the um, like I said, poverty alleviation, development, uh, marginalized individuals. And I think that will continue to be a really, that will obviously continue be, to be a strong focus, uh, even more so in future, I think, given the crisis that we're seeing developing here, I think um, social entrepreneurs will probably be moving more towards solutions that work in say rural areas, uh, and of course, also working with low-cost low technologies and technological solutions, because that's essentially what we need in, in, a, in a country as large as this. Whilst my sense is that social enterprises in Europe and US may have more of a broader remit of social enterprises, uh, sorry, of social entrepreneurship. So they, they may work in, 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 in a range of sectors that aren't, say, critical needs sectors, which is what the work is focused on here. So I think much more practice oriented work here, whilst the social enterprises in Europe and, and US will um, work in much more, sp in smaller spaces, I think, um, because the, the state is able to provide for a lot of the gaps that social enterprises in India fill, um, they're quite, they, they operate quite differently. I hope uh, the question is answered clearly, uh, Mr. Vikram Chatsi. Uh, the second question is from Shubhamoy, sir, Shubhamoy Banerjee. He's a faculty of Central Global Business School. So his question is, how can self-help groups be made an integral part of the social entrepreneurship ecosystem? Oh, interesting. Uh, so How can? Yeah. So I think social and so, so self-help groups are already sort of, they're already part of it because they are working via microfinance organizations that are, of course, part of the social enterprise space. Um, but it's true that they are not the core part of social enterprise ecosystems. I think, you know, I, I talked about the need to be more, that the social enterprise space so far has been quite urban, uh, quite English speaking. And I think we probably will see an, a, a, a shift away um, to be more incorporated to incorporate more of um, rural India to move away from say just English and very private sector language. Um, and again, when we talk about blended finance, maybe there are financing models that can actually work with self-help groups directly rather than first having to, rather than working with microfinance organizations that then work with um, self-help groups. But right now the, the ecosystems are quite different. Self-help groups are quite separate from um, Tougher groups and other, say, non-profits that work with women and livelihoods tend to be quite separate from the social enterprise ecosystem. Uh, the next question is from Anuj Kapoor, sir. So uh, he is also from Jindal Global Business School. He's faculty. So his question is, how can social innovation help in protecting the vulnerable rural people, especially from the pandemic? From? From the pandemic. Oh, from the pandemic, sorry. Um, from COVID-19, yes. So I think, um, I mean, I, I think it's a range of, so we, I, gave you, I gave you a few examples in the, in the presentation, but I think the, it's broad, I think that it's not so much that you bring new innovations out that are suddenly going to cater to rural people. I think it's, uh, using existing innovations, existing, I think, sorry, let me, let me rephrase this. I think it's about 
reframing the way we look at social innovation um, to focus primarily on reaching the masses. So if that means that you have a, a, a digital solution or a low cost tech solution, that's great, but you need to have a low cost digital or tech solution that can cope with the, um, the energy, electricity and connectivity realities of rural India. And I think we are seeing that more and more, um, a focus on how to deal with, um, how to work in geographies that aren't as well connected as urban spaces. I hope that answers your question. Uh, so that was our last question. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sony Ma'am, for taking your time out from a very busy schedule. It was a very interactive and informative session. And we are very fortunate to have you amongst us today. And it was, uh, as a student, it was very en enlightening for me because maybe I might start a startup which is more socially oriented rather than a corporate mm -hmm. or a corporate mm -hmm. job. And it is very interesting that this, so it was very good having you ma'am with us, uh, amongst us. Uh, I'm very privileged to be the host of you. And uh, a very big thanks to all the participants. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. The webinar will be available on YouTube and in the center's webpage. So please do share with your colleagues, students, and whoever who have missed the session. We'll be back again next week with a different perspective of the impact of COVID-19. Until then, take care, stay safe, and bye.